Hello, class, and welcome. Uh, today's lecture is over rethinking human nature. Here. Um, this is the first lecture on the book um, as we start a new week. Kevin Corcoran is the author. Um, he's a Christian philosopher. He's at Calvin College. Um, pretty bright guy. I hope you enjoy the book. Again, these lectures are intended to sort of help uh, give you some handrails as you approach the reading, which can be difficult. Um, philosophy is sort of, I always tell students, it's like a new set of muscles. When you start exercising a new set of muscles, it's difficult. You get really sore pretty easily, and you just got to have to sort of keep working those muscles, and it just gets easier and easier. But philosophy is not something that people get exposed to very often. So um, hopefully these lectures will be of some assistance. So we're sort of going to be embarking on this text. Um, We've been talking about philosophy, some of the tools of philosophy, what it means to be rational, what it means to be a critical thinker, what are some different argument forms, how do we evaluate those argument forms, sort of getting a tool set with regard to philosophy and evaluating ideas. Now we sort of start the content portion of the course, um, and I, I want to talk about what it means to be human a little bit um, as it relates to spiritual formation as notions of human nature play a role in character formation, in Christian morality, and in virtue. So that's sort of where we're going. And so this is the portion where we begin to talk about what it means to be human. And in fact, the, the main issue or the big question that uh, Kevin Corcoran's book addresses is, what kind of thing is a human person? Right? What does it mean to be human? And there are lots of directions this can go. We're going to sort of isolate it to a particular philosophical discourse surrounding this question. What kind of a thing is a human person? And so we have several philosophical options. This is not an exhaustive list, but I think this represents sort of the most popular philosophical arguments available to us right now. So the first philosophical option available to us is dualism. There are various forms of dualism. Uh, in fact, in the reading, you're going to read about three different forms of dualism. But in a general sense, right, all dualistic theories hold that there are two distinct substances that make up a human person. Often in the, in the literature, it's referred to as a mind. And when we say mind, we mean often soul, especially in religious contexts. We mean that non-physical part of humans, that there's a spiritual part to a human. That's what we mean right, by mind, soul, spirit, non-physical. So dualists hold that there is that element. And then also there is a body. And typically, that means matter, material substance. So I've got hands, a brain, a body, arms and legs. And then also I've got this non-physical component. Often we call it a soul. It's in philosophical literature, it's uh, thought to be the rational part of the human, where I have the ability to be conscious, rational, thoughtful, moral. My personality at, uh, in the past was thought to be sort of part of the soul. And then it was housed in this physical thing, this physical machine we call a body. Different forms of dualism, but that's sort of an overview of uh, dualism generally. Another alternative available to us is to say the human person is nothing more than their physical body. Um, you hear a lot of nothing more, nothing but arguments in materialism. We call those reductionary arguments or reductionism taking something very complex and reducing it to something simple. So human beings, for all of our complexity, we're really nothing more than electrons, neutrons, protons, cells, right? all these things put together, and they make up human tissue, human brain, human organs. And that's what we are. Often, materialists will make the argument in a universal sense, and they'll say, all of reality, everything that exists, is physical in nature. That's it. There is no supernatural existence. There is no non-physical reality. There is no spiritual 
reality, everything is matter. Then we have Kevin Corcoran's view that he's going to advocate in the book, and it's called the Constitution View. And I'm not going to give too many details yet, but we'll get there as we go through the reading in the text. And so his view is that humans are essentially physical creatures that cannot exist without their bodies. So I am an embodied person. I cannot exist without my body. But humans are not identical to their bodies, and this is where he separates himself from the materialist. I cannot be reduced to my body. I am more than that, right? And so what does it mean to say I can't survive without my body to be embodied, and yet I am more than my body? We're going to talk about that as we go along. All right. A note, and, and this in the book is on page 18, 19, and 20. He sort of talks about what it means to be a Christian philosopher, at least from his perspective. And I, I want to make I want to talk about this a little bit. I, I really appreciate him putting this in the intro. And in many respects, I agree with the things that he says there. Uh, I'm also a Christian attempting to be a philosopher. Um, so one of the things he notes is that um, you know, there is a core for him to the Christian faith, and uh, Christian beliefs sort of move out from that core in concentric circles. So you have a core of beliefs. He calls them sort of orthodox. Uh, he references the creeds, um, the Nicene Creed, the Apostolic Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and these encompass things like the divinity of Jesus, that God is three and one, um, that the, there's a virgin birth, uh, the second coming, um, the death and resurrection of the body. So he sort of goes through some of these core creedal beliefs, and he argues that as a philosopher, he's going to do philosophy in ways that are compatible with these core orthodox beliefs, that any conclusion that is in conflict with them places one outside of Orthodox Christianity. But he believes that philosophy can work within these Orthodox beliefs, that they're not irrational, that principles of reason can actually go to support these creeds, and that can work within them. He also believes, as do I, and makes an argument, that philosophy can be done in a way that is compatible with Scripture. Uh, of course, it's a particular interpretation of Scripture, but he thinks that the way he does philosophy, and I would argue similarly, the way I do philosophy, is compatible with orthodox ways of interpreting scripture. There's always going to be some disagreement, but the idea is as Christian philosophers, we're attempting to use the principles of philosophy, ways of arguing, ways of thinking. Um, and we want to use these inside of and in ways that are compatible with a Christian worldview. Um, and so I find that to be very helpful. I hope it's helpful to you. With that said, a key quote on page 20 from Corcoran, if a belief that is not central to Christian orthodoxy, but has nevertheless held a prominent place within that tradition, is false, and I can offer a plausible account of how the tradition may have come to that belief, then it is permissible for me to humbly, and with fear and trembling, depart from tradition with respect to that belief. What he's saying is, if there's a belief not central to Christian orthodoxy, remember those concentric circles moving out, a belief that's not incompatible with this core of orthodoxy, but nevertheless might be a very important, uh, held a prominent place within Christian orthodoxy, if a belief that is not central but still prominent is shown to be false or is called into question for good reason, then Corcoran argues that he can, with fear and trembling, depart from the tradition with, this res with respect to that belief. What he has in mind in this particular book is departing from dualism. The idea that I have this soul that is sort of stuck on, added to my body, and when my body dies, my soul will then float off to some metaphysical reality that we call heaven, and my body will simply decay in the earth. He feels that dualism is compatible with Christianity, but he does not believe that a Christian is obligated to accept dualism. 
right? So a Christian can accept dualism, but they're not obligated to. And so he's going to give philosophical arguments why he thinks dualism is inadequate and why his constitution view is a better philosophical option, as well as being compatible with scripture, the resurrection, life after death. So we'll see how much you accept his argument, if you think it's strong or weak. But this is, he's sort of setting this up. Rejecting dualism for Corcoran does not place him outside the Christian tradition um, and Christian orthodoxy. And I agree, and I would support him in this. And so you'll be hearing these arguments as we go through. So the first um, way of thinking about human nature or what it means to be human, how humans are constituted, is dualism. And so in the reading you have read about Descartes, you see the dates, he was alive, he was in France, uh, he was sort of this all-encompassing, um, sort of brilliant man, he was a mathematician, he was a scientist, he knew as much about the human body um, as anybody at that time, for the most part, he was also a philosopher. I mean, he was sort of one of these transcendent sort of Renaissance men. We're going to be looking at just a very small part of his philosophy uh, as it relates to dualism. And some of this is in your reading, but hopefully this will just, you know, give, give handrails uh, and maybe a little bit more explanation of some of it. The kind of dualism that Descartes is given credit for we call substance dualism. That means there are two substances, non-physical substance, the soul, physical substance, the body. Descartes is a Catholic. He is using philosophy in some sense to, to argue for and to justify traditional Christian and Catholic beliefs regarding the soul. And he thinks he can use philosophy for these proofs and we're going to sort of see them. Um, so for Descartes, the essence of human nature is to think. So at my core, what I am is a thinking thing. My identity is derived from that, which means my identity is wrapped up in my soul, because that's the part of me that thinks. Right? And here's a quote from Descartes. My essence consists in that I am a thinking thing or substance whose whole essence or nature is to think. Descartes also acknowledges that he has a body as well, and this leads, of course, to Descartes' dualism. There are two distinct substances in the universe, thinking substances, minds, souls, and non-thinking substances, bodies. Substance dualism. So now you get my, my sort of my graph. They're not that great, sorry, but uh, hopefully they'll help a little bit. Not only does Descartes think you've got two substances, but he also thinks that the two interact with each other. So you've got minds, and you've got bodies. Mental states affect physical states, and physical states affect mental states, right? And so um, it's not just that they're separate, but they also interact. And we see this all the time, right? So as an example, if I was out with my wife, and um, suddenly I see her talking to some strange man, and they're sort of laughing, and it looks like they're flirting or something. Me seeing that interaction is a physical state, right, with my eyes. But it's going to create a mental state in me, namely like jealousy, right? Um, and then that mental state jealousy will probably then cause or at least affect other physical states like me walking over there, hello, I'm her husband, or you know, introducing myself very sternly or something like that. Um, and so this happens all the time with this interaction between physical and mental. It's happening to you right now. You are looking at your screen, hearing me talk. These are all physical things. But they're creating thoughts in you, which are not physical for Descartes. So two things, and then they interact with each other. A different picture, right? You've got uh, this, this person here. Boy, this, is, this does not look good. Um, and he, the body is right here. We've got a brain. that is very relevant for our thinking. Descartes believed that as well. But separate from this is this mind or soul. So that for Descartes, right, I put my hand, let's say there's a fire, see this point right here, there's a there's fire burning. The guy puts his hand in the fire, it sends a signal to the brain. The brain communicates with the mind or soul. 
mind your soul back to the brain, pain, we jerk our hand out. So you've got this extra interaction, right? And so it's almost as though the brain is sort of the, the, the seat uh, for, for the mind, this, this communication that goes back and forth um, between the two. But, they, the, the, but our minds or our souls is, are separate from brain activity. So there's essentially two parts to this dualism. One is to make an argument that there are, in fact, two substances separate, right? So he's not a materialist. The second part is to say that they interact with each other. So two, two separate arguments. We're going to emphasize the first, that you have, in fact, two substances. If you can show that, the interaction piece is really easy. It requires almost no argument. The real debate is about this first element of, are there really two substances? So we're going to listen to some philosophical arguments supporting dualism of this kind. All of them are going to rely on Leibniz's law. And Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz was a famous philosopher uh, in the modern period. And uh, he sort of used this principle of logic quite a bit. And so it ended up getting titled Leibniz's law. Uh, I believe the official title is The Non-Identity of Discernibles. Um, but we're just going to call it Leibniz's law. And it states that if two things do not have identical properties, then they are not identical. And that seems like common sense. If I hold up this pen, right? I don't know if you can see this, but they are not identical. One is darker than the other, different manufacturers, right? All kinds of things, different grips slightly. And so as a result, they have different properties. We know that they're not identical. So Descartes uses this principle of logic that pretty much everyone accepts, and he says, well, I can use it to show that we have minds and bodies, and the two are not the same. So his first argument is, we call it the argument from doubt. Before I go into this argument, um, I want to say a little bit about Descartes in terms of background. Descartes' famous, one of his famous works is called Meditations on First Philosophy. I encourage you to read it if you enjoy philosophy. It's a really uh, impactful book on the history of Western philosophy. But in Meditations, he starts by saying, I want to find a place of certainty. So Descartes' journey sort of begins with, I want certainty. How do I find that? Descartes goes, sort of starts this process or starts this journey by saying, I'm going to doubt everything that I can possibly doubt. Anything that I have the least doubt about, I'm just going to throw it away and consider it false until I can find that thing that I cannot doubt, because then I know I found certainty. So he starts by saying, well, I can't be anything that comes to me through sense experience, I cannot be certain of. So anything that, well, first of all, anything that deals with the future can't be certain of. You, you, you are not certain that the sun will rise tomorrow. You are not certain that you will die. You are not certain about taxes. You are not certain. No. The world could end the next second from now. For all we know, that's possible, which means you can't be certain. Uh, it's possible that you don't die. Jesus returns and you simply ascend into heaven. It's possible, which means you can't be certain of death. Nothing that is in the future can be certain. The past, it, you have a hard time being certain especially the history that you did not first-hand experience. So you can't be certain of any of those things. Sense experience, which gives you your knowledge of history and gives you almost all of your knowledge walking around, starting your car, talking with friends, that you can't be certain of for Descartes. But why? Well, because senses sometimes deceive us. You think you see water on the road, but you recognize it's just a mirage as you get closer. Your eyes deceive you. You go to a magic show, it looks like people get cut in half. People are levitating, things, weird things are appearing or disappearing. Now you tell yourself, well, that can't be true because you have reason, but your senses have been deceived because it looks like that's exactly what's happened. Um, he gives the phantom limb example. When you lose a limb and you think it's still there, it feels like it's still there, but it's not. Senses deceive you. 
Well, if your senses have deceived you in the past, you can't be certain they're not deceiving you now, so sense experience cannot lead to certainty. Descartes also talks about dreams. This is a big part of it. Uh, last night, Descartes says, I dreamed that I was at my desk writing, when in reality I was just laying in my bed, asleep. But it was real. Until I woke up, that was real. People can feel emotions in their dreams. People wake up crying. All kinds of things happen, and then you wake up to this deeper reality, and you're like, oh, that was just a dream. Descartes says, but it's possible I'm dreaming now, and then I'll wake up in some other reality. And that was all a dream, and I thought I was so sure, but, it, but now, nope. It's always possible. You could be in the Matrix. You'll wake up one day in a different reality, right? A dream world of some kind. Is it probable? No. But it's possible, which means you can't be certain. You could be dreaming right now. So he starts to strip away conceivably, conceivably everything. What, what can I be certain of? Apparently now I guess I have to be a skeptic. But then Descartes hits this place of certainty. And he says, but in the midst of all of this, I can be certain of one thing, and that is my own existence. If I'm thinking at all, I must exist. Even if all of my thoughts are false. Even if I'm in a dream world and I'm just dreaming this, I still have to exist to dream. Even if there's some evil deceiver making me think things are true that are really false, I have to exist to be deceived. The moment you doubt your existence, you prove your existence. Right? The moment you doubt whether you exist or not, you've already proven you've existed because you have to exist to doubt. And so Descartes says, aha, certainty, I exist. And this is where the famous quote comes in, I think, Therefore, I am. Right? The purpose was to refute skepticism and to say we can be certain of some things. From that foundation of certainty, Descartes will construct arguments. He'll say things like, well, I know that I did not create myself. That means some other existence has to be, right? something else has to exist that brought me into existence because I didn't create myself. And then he uses that to eventually prove God's existence and so on. Try to prove. For the purposes of this class, he's going to use this in his argument for the soul. So he says, premise one, I can doubt my body. If sense experience is fallible, then I cannot be certain that I have a body. I might just be a brain in a jar, having thoughts, having a dream that I have a body. I might be a non-physical thing, again, that simply is in a dream world that thinks it has a body. I can doubt whether I have a body or not. However, I cannot doubt that I have a mind. The moment I doubt whether I have a mind, I've proven that I have a mind. The moment I doubt whether I exist, I have to exist because I'm thinking. So my body doesn't prove my existence, my thoughts. My mind proves my existence. So I can doubt that I have a body. I cannot doubt that I have a mind. Well, now Leibniz's law. If two things do not have identical properties, then the two things are not identical. We already have seen. We have different properties. Therefore, my body cannot be identical with my mind. My body cannot be identical with my soul. We have two separate things here. Philosophical argument to try and prove that dualism is true, or at least justify it. Argument from divisibility. Second argument. Premise one. I can divide my body. Any physical body, in theory, for Descartes, can be divided. So take, any, take my arm, I can divide it up. Take an atom, divide. Whatever you want to say, these bodies can be divided. But Descartes argued, but the, but the mind is a simple substance. You can't divide the mind. It makes up a holistic sort of person or identity. You can't just chop it up. You can't separate it or divide it. Well, if bodies can be divided, but minds cannot be divided, then Leibniz's law says that they can't be the same thing because they have at least one property that's different. Therefore, minds are not bodies and bodies are not minds. You have two separate things going on. The book gives a few other arguments as well. I'm just going to highlight these three. Finally, 
the argument from separability or the separability argument, premise one, if I can clearly and distinctly conceive of one thing existing without another thing existing, then the two things are distinct. This is another formulation of Leibniz's law. If I can conceive of one thing existing without something else, the two things are not identical. Because if they were identical, once one thing stopped existing, the other thing would stop existing. Premise two. I can clearly and distinctly conceive of myself existing without my body existing. So I can conceive of my existence going on beyond death. I think we all can. I can conceive of myself watching my own funeral, taking a roll or something, who's crying, who's really sad. Uh, and I can conceive of this because it seems possible that I, that I can exist without my body. But it doesn't seem to work the other way in terms of my body existing without my mind. Um, and so, he says, because I can conceive of them existing separately, uh, I am not the same thing as my body, and I can exist without it. So these three arguments for dualism. Now, you can stop here and sort of think about these arguments. Often students feel like, well, they make some sense, but they also seem um, a little bit odd, right? They, there's, something, there's something fishy about these arguments. So if you want to stop and sort of digest them, maybe go back and think about them a little bit, that's fine. I'm going to sort of give a critique of the arguments briefly. Uh, Corcoran does a much better, more thorough job. I'm just going to sort of point something out, um, and hopefully um, that will help. So we'll, for those who want to move on, we'll move on. The major problem that I see with Descartes' three arguments, as they stand, is that they tend to assume the conclusion that they're trying to justify. This is a big problem. Conclusions, as we've learned, are supposed to be justified by premises. So the argument is about taking a conclusion and then trying to justify it. But in Descartes' sense, I feel like in the argument, he's assuming the conclusion all along which means he's not justifying his conclusion. The point of making a conclusion is that you can't assume it. It has to be proved. It has to be argued for. So let me explain what I mean by this. Um, if you can doubt your mind, but you can't doubt your body, then you're already assuming that minds and bodies are separate. If my mind is nothing more than my brain, if my thoughts are nothing more than brain activity, my desires, my personality, all this, genetics and brain activity, then if I can't doubt my mind, then I can't doubt my brain either. Because there are no thoughts without the brain, assuming that they're identical, right? So if you say, I can doubt my body, but I cannot doubt my mind, saying you can doubt one without, but not the other is assuming that they're separate. Because again, if mental activity is nothing more than brain activity, you can't doubt one without doubting the other. If you can't doubt your mind, then you can't doubt your brain either, right? Well, same with divisibility. I can divide bodies, I can't divide minds. Yes, but if my mind is identical to my brain, then if one cannot be divided, the other cannot be divided. If one can be divided, then the other can be divided. So to say you can divide one and not another is to essentially assume the conclusion that you're trying to make, and that is that they're separate. Same with separability. You might be able to conceive of two things existing separately, but it still might not be the case that they can actually exist separately. I may, I may be able to conceive of Clark Kent existing without Superman, but that doesn't mean that Clark Kent can exist without Superman. And so Descartes runs into certain problems with these arguments. As much as I admire his attempt, and that doesn't mean dualism is false. This in no way means dualism is false. It just means maybe some of Descartes' arguments need work. right? So I hope this helps make some sense. The last thing I want to talk about in this lecture, he moves on to a second form of dualism. And actually, there's a third form that I'm not going to lecture on, but it's in the reading. The second form of dualism is called compound dualism. The third form is called emergent dualism. 
But let me talk about compound dualism briefly. Thomas Aquinas is given credit. He is a Catholic priest in the 13th century. You can see the dates. Compound dualism is similar to substance dualism in that they both believe there are these two substances, non-physical and physical, souls and bodies. But there are some differences as well, so I want to talk about that. So for Aquinas, there are two substances. Soul, she calls form, gives us the human form, people we are, and matter, with the physical stuff. Excuse me. For Aquinas, each of these substances is incomplete in itself. This is very different than Descartes. Descartes argues that each substance is complete in itself, so that a soul is complete, the body is complete, and the soul, in fact, is so complete that it can live without the body, at, right? It's, it, it's basically we stay intact as a person and just exist in another realm with our souls. We don't need the bodies to be who we are. But for Aquinas, this isn't necessarily the case because each substance is incomplete in itself. It's only complete when the two are found together. So the human person emerges for Aquinas when soul and matter unite. This union forms a complete substance. Two incomplete substances coming together to form a complete substance, a human person. Thus, a human person is not identical with their soul or their body. Rather, they're identical to the union of the two. For Descartes, we're identical to our souls. So this is another difference between Aquinas and Descartes. A human person is a soul-body composite, not just the soul, not just the body. You can see Corcoran's critiques of compound dualism on page 39. My big question for the compound dualist is, what about the afterlife? Um, if my soul is incomplete in and of itself and it requires the body to form a composite whole, if my body is in a coffin rotting in the ground, then and my, is my soul still incomplete in the afterlife? How does that work? And so I think there are some theological issues to consider as well. Um, but again, I encourage you to do the reading. Make sure you look at emergent dualism, which I think the reading starts for that on Tuesday. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I look forward to getting to know you better online.